once you find out that like you have cancer and you get into like the flow of things, it is, they have you going nonstop one thing after another and there's really not time to think about it. I don't think the whole like processing you have cancer part happens, at least it didn't for me until treatment stopped. I was 36 years old. I had an extremely stressful job. Um, I was, I am, I'm not was, I am a part-time mom of, um, single mom of two children. Um, so couple that with, you know, working 50 plus hours a week, um, having some events at the office go on. I, I was telling myself that the reason I was exhausted and fatigued and I'm one of those that when I'm stressed out, I don't eat. So all of those things, right, were norms for me. It wasn't until, and that would have been, I'd say, it, that totally took over October of 2016. Now, if I look back in photos, um, the weight loss, like significant, like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with her. You can start seeing that in July of 2016. I decided to go on a, on a trip and I told one of my girlfriends, I was like, I am so tired. My workout routine, it must be stale. That's what it is. There can't be anything else going on. I just need to decompress. And so I started doing a completely different workout. And in doing so, the doctors think what ended up happening was the tendons that had wrapped themselves around the tumor, which was the size of a cantaloupe, and I only weighed 115 pounds. You couldn't see it is the really weird thing. Um, started rubbing differently. And so I thought I was developing a UTI and called my nurse practitioner and said, hey, I'm gonna be driving back from the house in Florida. Can you call in um, a prescription for me? I think I have a UTI. And so I did that. Um, and at that time, that was the, right? Like it still was, I don't, I mean, I don't get them frequently, but like, okay, that's like a normal thing. I've had them before. So maybe this is just caused from all the stress and everything else. Um, January 2nd was when I would say, um, I, ended, I went to urgent care. They did an x-ray. Um, cysts like this don't show up on x-rays. And so um, they just want to make sure nothing else was going on. I don't know what they thought may have shown up on the x-ray, but um, they switched me to Cipro, which if you're familiar with that, that's supposed to knock everything out within like 24 hours. And 24 hours later, it still hadn't worked. And um, at that point in time, it was probably me taking, I don't know, 10, 20 steps and having to bend over because the pain was so significant. Um, and it honestly felt like I was in labor and I was like, this is just not normal. So I went to the ER and that was when, um, after a few, me persuading them that what they thought it was, um, wasn't what it was. We did a pelvic CT scan, um, with dye and both masses showed up. So I did have one on my left ovary and one on my right, but my right was the main culprit and um, what would come back as having ovarian cancer. So um, the physician on call that night in the ER, she, it was about 1.30 in the morning when she came and told me, hey, we did the ultrasound as well. You have masses. Didn't know. She said, you have a mass. She didn't tell me I had to, nor did she tell me how large it was. Um, on your right ovary, I need to, do you have an OBGYN? And I said, yeah. I said, actually, I delivered in this hospital. Um, she is on staff here, um, or at least has has rights to be in the hospital and in, in, in the OR here. And so they said, okay, I'm going to give her a call um, and we'll see what she wants to do. And they admitted me because the pain was, morphine wasn't managing it and they had to end up going to a dilated drip. And um, on top of that, they wanted to start a round of antibiotics. And so I was admitted and um, my OBGYN came in the next morning and she said, you, you look good. You look tired. How's the pain? And I was like, I am still in a ton of pain. And she's like, well, I, I think probably there's a little bit of an infection as well. Um, we're going to keep you on these antibiotics. I'm trying to get an OR, but um, I don't know how long that's going to be. And I ended up staying over the weekend there. In the time that I was there, I had my blood drawn at least every twice a day, vial, at, at least five vials. Well, you know, twice a day. Not one time did they ever draw CA125, 
which would have, which the type I have, it's not 100% foolproof, but the type that I had, it would have shown up as an elevated CA125 level, which could have triggered in their mind, okay, we probably shouldn't just remove this. We should probably have her be with a gynecological oncologist to do the, the, the removal. Um, what it was explained to me that I had was a 12 centimeter, so about the size of a cantaloupe, dermoid cyst. And if you're familiar with that, those are the kind, I'm not grossed out by it because I had cancer, but in the beginning I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell anybody this is what I had? So it's the kind that grows um, teeth and hair and is really kind of interesting. It's super lumpy. Um, and so that wouldn't have triggered anything either. And um, so she said, you know, I ended up, I went home 24 hours before I had surgery. And she said, so long as you stay in bed, let's get you home so you can at least get some rest. And I did and came back um, the next day. So it was about a four day, four day window between when I was admitted to the ER and when we actually had surgery. And um, I said, okay, you know, that's fine. And they did a, and she wanted to try to do it without having to do more than a uh, C-section type of scar. And they were able to get it out that way. In doing so, the surgery took quite a bit longer. So in doing so, the membrane, I can't necessarily, so that my tumor had been compromised, whether or not it was compromised during surgery or whether it was compromised prior, we don't know. Um, but yeah, and, and she's considered surgery to be a success. Um, I stayed over one night because they couldn't get my blood pressure up and I was in like a tremendous amount of pain, which was probably due to the fact that they had just removed like a whole bunch of cancer and there was other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so she told me I'd have the results in 24 hours and she didn't expect for there to be any issues whatsoever. Wow. And so that, that was, I had no other, you know, I was like, okay, that sounds fine. So I didn't have any prep beforehand. Um, it was it was supposed to take like maybe 45 minutes, ended up taking closer to two hours just because of the size and the way that they wanted to try to get it out. I did also, they also had to remove um, the cyst, not my ovary on the left side. So they left it and they took my ovary and I think it was attached to the fallopian tube as well on the right side. And that was what was biopsied. Um, afterwards, it was... I don't know. I, women that have C-sections, I have a lot more respect for you because it was pretty challenging. Um, there was like, right? Like you can't, I had never had an abdominal surgery before. And so I hadn't thought about the fact that, you know, the, even though it was lower, so it's below your bikini line, um, having to try to like move and get out of bed and everything was, was challenging. I was still tired because I had cancer and I still really wasn't able to eat because I had ovarian cancer, which is one of the symptoms, like not feeling like you want to eat or feeling full quickly when you take a few bites. And so um, right around lunchtime on that Thursday, she called me. My mom was actually out. I felt hungry. And I said, she said, what do you want? And I said, uh, I think I want Chick-fil-A. And she was like, okay, fine. So the call came in and I was like, hey, how's it going? You know, totally just being my normal upbeat self. And she was like, I'm good. How are you feeling? And I was like, oh, I mean, you know, I'm super tired and oh man, this kind of hurts a lot. And, and it should have, I should have recognized like the tone in her voice at that point, but I didn't. And she's like, so I know why your labs took longer to, to get back. And I wasn't expecting this. And I have spent all morning trying to figure out, do I t call you and tell you to come into the office and then you know you're sick and you had to drive or do I tell you all over the phone? And she said, I decided to tell you over the phone because I didn't want you to have to get in the car and then have to drive out here and then drive back. And um, so she said, you have ovarian cancer, it's high grade, we have to get you to a gynecological oncologist very quickly. And I told her to give me a second and I put my, put the phone down. I had prepared myself, right? Like we're a week out. Um, I had actually talked to a friend who had had several cancer diagnoses or di however you pluralize that. But, um, and she said, you know, the further that you get out, the more chances 
it's, it's probably not good, especially when the lab's telling her that they're still running more results. And so in my head, I knew, so a dermoid cyst has a 1% chance of being ovarian cancer. Um, being my age, 36 at the time, I had a 6.7% chance of being di diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So put those two things together and my odds were going to be really low of it happening. But I had still told myself at this point that that was, it was very likely going to come back that way. And I remember I said, I just need a second. And I folded over in my bed, um, had a moment, sat up and took a deep breath. And I said, I'm really sorry. And she said, no, I'm really sorry. And I said, okay. So for the kids side of things, um, the director of the school where my son was actually had just had a neighbor go through breast cancer and her children are around the same age and they used a book. I did not use the book with them what I did was read the book to kind of see what it, it said. There are, so there are a lot of books out there that you can get off of Amazon or, or Barnes and Noble that walk through like mommy's sick or daddy's sick and break it down in those terms. Um, that initial part went okay. I think what I couldn't prepare for was them actually seeing me go through everything. Um, and they got, they got pretty tired of mommy always being sick and not being able to, to be there. And I did, I had, my support system was great. And so they, I got to everything, even if I thought I was going to be sick while I was there, that I made sure that every child thing that there was that I showed up for it. And I think that that's really key too. Um, just so that you can try to make things as normal as possible. Um, and the other thing I did with the kids was everybody wanted to help and wanted to do all of these things. And I said, let me get through, um, you know, a couple rounds and see what I'm dealing with. I don't know what I'm going to feel like, and I don't know where I need help. And what I ended up coming up with was, um, allowing for there to be meals brought in on the days that I had the kids specifically for my mother and the children. So I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to eat for the day. And I told them that, like, I was like, I don't want my mom to have to worry about feeding them and herself. If you guys could just make sure that they have food, you don't need to worry about me. Like I'm, my mom will make sure I have food. Um, and so that was super helpful. My tumor had ruptured and in doing so, it meant that it had, um, potentially, we still don't know, right? Cause you can't see it, but microscopic pieces were probably floating around in my abdominal fluid, which means it could have attached to different organs. Um, and that comes into play. So I had a full hysterectomy, including cervix and, um, in a debulking procedure for ovarian cancer, they are, so I have a, about a 13 inch incision. Um, my, stomach wall was they they checked to make sure nothing was there they check on all the other organs and then they actually um take out your in, intestines and or your colon whatever you want to call it and they go through that piece by piece because uh, a lot of what's in there is going to be granular and the only way to really find it is to is, is by touch right and in using the robotic procedure you're not able to do that thorough of a um of a check. So my momentum has gone as well. They now consider that an organ. It's a filter. Um, it catches everything. And usually that is the next place it goes once it ruptures. And I lucked out and I did not have it there either. Um, what we would find out having my uterus and everything removed was I did have a focus group of endometrial cancer as well. And so, um, I mean, that would have been done, whether you would have had it done, you know, the hysterectomy laparoscopically or robotically. So that was, and, and she knew that my, my goal was whatever I have to do to be here the longest, that was what we needed to do. And if that meant that maybe the measures were a little bit more extreme than me backing off and taking a lighter approach, then that was what I was going to do. But yeah. not knowing what stage it was and knowing that the tumor had ruptured, we really didn't have another option than a full, than a full open procedure. So the surgery, other than having, I had scans to make sure that nothing else lit up. That was going to be obvious, right? So that they could, they could try to X that out, right? So did that, did my blood work, um, did the whole don't eat after X, Y, Z time. Um, they had me drink a bottle of Gatorade to try to hydrate a couple hours before. Um, and I did that with 
I'm trying to think like at least two, maybe three of the procedures I've had. And, um, and then I went in, but one thing that I would recommend, so I have extremely low blood pressure. Um, so I told the, so I was going through the pre-op and they, where they, you know, they're going to do all of this. And for a, uh, the procedure I have, they normally do an epidural. So you have a block and you can't feel the significant amount of pain I was in. And I said something in the, the, uh, nurse anesthetist said, is there anything that we need to know about you? And I said, yes, please don't worry. When I come out of surgery, I'm going to be like 80, 85 or 55. And she said, I'm sorry, your blood pressure is going to be what? So due to the fact that was an important thing to tell them because um, an epidural actually lowers your blood pressure significantly more. And in telling them that I was not able to have the epidural and they went a different route that they normally do not for um, this. They actually put catheter um, pain bulbs in my abdomen. Um, they were in bags. They had, they just refilled them and stuff while I was at the hospital. But I think it's, the, you need to continually talk about like things like that. I think a lot of times people do not. And so, um, that was key. So it was five to six hours. Um, it was a pretty big deal. And, um, I think I woke up in a recovery room and maybe saw my parents. I don't really remember anything until I got up to the, um, floor that I was on, which was the gynecological oncology floor, I think at the time. I was the youngest person on the floor. Um, it was pretty empty while I was there. And I remember coming around the corner um, in the nurse's station and I was kind of like elevated up, you know, in the gurney. And they, the nurses, I remember them saying, is that her? There's no way, she doesn't look sick and she's so young. And I think that's what a lot of people's reactions are, but and they probably didn't think that I would hear them and or remember. And I did. Um, I shared a room with an older woman who was going through ovarian cancer. Um, and the thing that I will tell you about all the older women that are going through this, and, sh and she said to my parents several times, you know, like, I'm so sorry, this isn't fair to her. She shouldn't be going through this. And they're not just like, we're, the doctors aren't used to seeing someone of a younger age. The women that have been diagnosed and are either recovering from surgery or going through chemo aren't used to seeing you either. And they don't like it because they know, you know, the, the road you're going to have ahead of you. Um, I would say the recovery from the full debulking procedure was significantly easier um, pain wise than the first surgery. Um, it could have just been the post care that I had you know, the stuff that they sent me home with and everything like that. I did go on blood thinners for hmm, at least two weeks. It could have been three. Um, very hard to get in up and down. I would say your best option is a recliner. That's what I had because I was able to at least like push myself up to the stage to where, you know, I could at least put my arms out and, and like not try to help and just have somebody pull me up. Um, and then two weeks later, I would find out um, what my staging was and went back. And, and this time I did the same as I did the first time I wanted to go back by myself and the resident came in first. And I remember I totally broke down and I was like, how bad is it? And, um, she was like, it's, 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 I can't give you that everything, you know, it's going to be fine. We're going to need to do chemo, yada, yada, yada. And I was in, and, and so then Andrea came in and she said, so we got the news that we wanted. It's one C. However, and I'm like, what is this however? Like, why do I keep having this however? And she's, however, you threw us for a loop. You also have a focus group of endometrial cancer, which we did not see coming. Mm -hmm. So instead of having four rounds of chemo, you're going to definitely need to have the six mm -hmm. um, to kind of combat that. She said, and I'm going to have to have you do genetic testing because I need to make sure that you don't have Lynch syndrome, mm -hmm. um, which would, which is pretty um, common for somebody with Lynch syndrome to ho have both at the same time. Um, and so again, let's just hit the ground running. And so we went through the drugs I would be on, which was uh, carboplatinum and Taxol. Um, and um, I would receive one treatment every three weeks of both my, my treatments. She mapped it all out. It, was, it took about six to seven hours, depending on how I could drip. And um, I met my nurses. 
And uh, I, th I think she explained to my parents again, I think I said, can you just tell my parents I can't, I can't do this right now. If you could do that, that would be great. And so I think they came back and she explained everything again and had my port placement done. And um, then the following week I would start. So three weeks post-surgery, I started chemo. So I am not normal again when it comes to the chemo side of things, but I slept the entire time from the second it started dripping until one, so 8 a.m. until about 1.30 p.m. I, I slept the majority of the time. I might be up for just a little bit. Um, there's a lot of moving around the nurses do. I had two nurses. There were, I was at a um, eight or nine chair um, and it was only gynoc. So I did luck out there. It was all of us had some kind of gynecological cancer and we all had the same two nurses and it was like an open square um, with a couple seats in the middle. Uh, my family, oh, my mom and my dad and, and usually a friend or two would always come. I think they entertained themselves because like I said, I was sleeping, but I was prepared. Like I made sure I had, again, my one friend, she was amazing. She, um, gave me all the tips and tricks and I probably looked like a bag lady because on the good, on the, on the off chance that I was going to feel good, I wanted to make sure I had things to do. So I had an iPad and I had my computer and books and all these other things that they tell you to do, but I didn't use one of them and, um, brought snacks and <laughs> didn't need any of them. But, um, I did line my chemo chair with a blanket and then I had another blanket to put on top of me because it is cold in those. And I wanted to be as comfortable as I could be. And they always, they, the nurses always laughed and thought it was so funny because I would just like walk in and get everything situated. And then I'd go to my doctor's appointment and then I'd go and, and do my chemo. And, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, I passed the time by sleeping. That's all I can say. I know a lot of people will color, um, or do crossword puzzles. And like I said, that kind of thing. I always made sure I had, um, I did drink a bottle of Gatorade while I was there for electrolytes. Um, and water tasted awful to me, so I couldn't do that. But yeah, yeah take things to entertain yourself. So day one, I went into anaphylactic shock. <laughs> I was allergic to uh, Taxol. Um, and I, so you normally have an allergic reaction between like before the 13 minute mark, maybe before the 10 minute mark. I was at the 15 minute mark and it came on. I got hot and I was telling my mom, something is it right here. And I tried to cough and I was like, I couldn't breathe. And so um, on my first day, I thought that I was not going to be able to receive this drug and now what do I do because this was my only chance of living and things like that that's not what happens they ended up giving me um, you know plenty of things to reverse the side effects I then got um, you know some fluids and whatnot and then they started it all over again very slowly a lot of it has to do with the speed at which you drip to and so um, I was a very slow dripper since I got um, stick to it. Now, the weird thing is, is with Taxol, the longer you take it, the less reaction you have to it. With carboplatin, the longer you take it, the more chance you will have an allergic reaction to it. And so they were really worried that I was going to, towards the end of the rounds, start having a reaction to carboplatinum. But I didn't. I lucked out. Um, they also say that you're going to get this steroid high after your chemo when they give you the steroids to take. I never got it. As soon as my um, chemo started dripping, I got extremely sick. So I was in bed, nauseous um, and whatever, for at least five days straight. Uh, ended up back in the hospital after my fourth round for, to get a bag of fluids. That was the worst I'd ever been. And, um, it was the only time I was wheeled in and out of the hospital other than for my debulking surgery. Um, outside of that, once I got through the, the five days afterwards, it was a lot of nausea until I got into the last week before I would last five days before I headed back into chemo. And I felt pretty decent on those days. Okay. Nausea is extremely hard to explain um and the fatigue and uh had a very heavy metal taste which is common with the type of um chemo i was given okay. so don't wait until you get sick they tell you you're gonna get sick yeah. so just go ahead and start taking the anti-nausea pills because once you're to that point there's no coming back like it just doesn't work and i got 
so I was in menopause at, at two, right? Like surgically induced menopause. And I remember that was, I couldn't, the, the night sweats and from the chemo and the menopause and, and just everything was just so much afterward. It was just amplified so much. Okay. So, uh, they told me between, by the time I came back from my second round of chemo, all of my hair would be gone. I anticipate that it started falling out two weeks later or, or that it would be gone two weeks later. And so this, so 12 days after my first round, I had decided I was going to do, it wasn't my choice how I, that I got cancer, but how I was going to go about doing everything that I had an option in. I was going to make sure that I was fully, this was my choice. This is how it's going to go. You can tell me that I have to do this and you can tell me that I can have to do this, but on the things that are my choice, I'm going to own them and make them my own. And so I knew that me going from having hair to having none at all was going to be really difficult for the kids. And in my mind, what could I do? And so I had a party, I had a head shaving party and um, my two kids and um, my friend's daughter, who I call my niece, um, she's, she was younger. She might've been, well, if Jackson was three, she was maybe one and a half and, um, they shaved my head and, the, and Olivia got the first swipe out at my daughter. Um, and one of my girlfriends helped her. And then, um, but the funny thing was like, I was trying to do everything to not like have a nervous breakdown during all of this too. Right. So like, so all I was left with at that point in time was my eyelashes and my eyebrows and maybe just a couple strands, but I used a towel to go around and try to get the rest of it to come off. So I got a wig because I thought I was going to wear a wig because um, I did not know what I was going to look like without hair, right? Like I had no idea like what my head looked like. Um, well, none of us do. And um, so I had, got, I had gotten a wig before. I think I got the wig even before I started treatment. It was one of the things I did before I started. So I didn't have to worry about it in case I was super sick. And so, um, loved it. It was beautiful. It was long. It was totally different. Um, I still have it. I wore it twice, maybe three times for, um, I'm going to say this is for all over all stages of ovarian. I don't think that they do another scan until after you've finished what is considered your first, um, first regimen. Right. And so, I got done with that and I remember leaving my sixth round of chemo and I had to have um, new Lasta and um, I didn't think I was going to have, I hated it. It was awful, but I didn't think I was going to have to have it after my sixth round. Right? Like I'm not, I'm not doing this again, like no big deal. And I remember we went through, you know, the end of the chemo treatment, just like we did and they put it on. And I said, I don't really like, let's not do it. I don't have to do this again. It doesn't matter what my white blood cell count is. It'll eventually come up. And my nurse said to me, that's what we're hoping for. But I have to prepare you that if your scans don't come back, right? Like we'll have to do a few more rounds. And that thought had never crossed my mind, right? Like I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I did not like, what? and um found out that i had no evidence of disease and we were able to move on to the three month mark um or every three months i had to at that point in time for the first two years i had to do uh just blood draws and we would do scans as needed um and in that first between july and october i had to have two um and everyone always talks about how you know you're you have anxiety around all of this. And so, you know, be prepared for the, your mind to kind of play tricks on you. And I went into that appointment on July 3rd and I had, a, I had the resident that I had all the time and um, she was doing her rotation and she came in and I said, listen, I'm going to tell you this. And I'm also going to preface it with, I think this is all in my head. I said, so know that I'm aware that I'm probably like making this up but I think there is a lump or something is causing me to have to go to the bathroom frequently. And I feel a bump right where the tumor was. I think it's all in my head. So she didn't, she felt around. She was like, let me go get the doctor. I'll be right back. Well, it ends up, I did have a bump, but it wasn't cancer and it had shown up on the scan. So what I had was a lymphocyte lymphocele, I think is what they call it. And so it was a pocket of lymphatic fluid that was actually filling up where the, um, 
the tumor would have been kind of sort of, mm-hmm. and it was pushing down on my bladder because, and, and, you know, mimicking the same symptoms that I would have had in my case, it was. So and thankfully I had saved it. Hurt. So I'm going on three years at this point. Um, my last checkup was in July um, and I got the all clear on everything um, in regards to that. And so we are on to my next six months. I, I'm at six months at this point. So I went um, th- every three months for my first two years in years three through five or until five, I'll go um, every six months. And then at the five year m- mark, I'll go annually. So I would tell anyone that's newly diagnosed to decide yourself what is the best plan for you and how you want to receive information, how you want to lose your hair, how you want treatment to go, who you want to be a part of this. It's all your choice. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. And and we have those caretakers around us. And Although they feel like they are going through it with you, they are not going through it. It isn't happening to them. And that's something that not only you have to remember, but they have to remember. And I don't want to downplay their role at all because I will never be able to repay um, my caretakers um, for all that they gave up in order to make sure that I was okay. Um, it is going to feel like you are going through the worst possible thing ever. But if you can put one foot in front of the other every day, you will get to that finish line, whatever it is. And then you take the next steps. So you have to take one, each step at a time. And once you get a plan in place, things start to seem a whole lot easier because you know what you need to do and you focus on that. For those of you that have just finished up, um, your treatment and you are stuck at the edge of the cliff, basically where you feel like your doctors are pushing you off the edge and you're a baby bird and you have no idea how you're supposed to navigate all of this, none of us do. Um, Your life is completely different. It's not a bad thing. It takes a while to adjust. Figure out what works for you. It's not gonna be the same as it was before. And maybe you don't want for it to be the same as it was before because you're realizing things now that you wouldn't have in the past. And I know that's how it is for me. Um, Do I miss the carefree, I call it being naive to all that is cancer? Absolutely, I do. Um, If you read anything on my social media, you'll see from time to time, I'll say my favorite place to have a breakdown is the shower floor because it's it's quiet and nobody can hear me. And even though I look upbeat and positive all the time, you're still allowed to have your 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 moments because this wasn't fair and it shouldn't have happened and my body still hurts and I still have to go to these appointments and it's exhausting. I get it. You're gonna be able to figure out how this works. 